أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وصل اللهم على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل للعقدة من لساني يفقه قولي <تصفيق> so السلام عليكم we're um, we're gonna try in I'm gonna try to do this kind of quick so that that way we can get to the question part because when talking about the fiqh of Ramadan or any fiqh issues in general we want to try and get as many questions as uh, possible um, Sheikh Farid was supposed to be here uh, now I'm here so um, you know, I'll do my best to, to answer any questions uh, that we have uh, just a note I'm going off of the, um, the OIC Fiqh Council and the uh, Ejma Fiqh Council of North America so the majority of the rulings that are coming from uh, these two entities are what is going to be displayed I understand that there are a variety of different opinions out there so you know I'm gonna do my best to try and give the different opinions and to show what the majority opinions are for most of these subject matters but before we begin the art of fasting in general is something that needs to be discussed because fasting the word fast in general CM in Arabic it linguistically means to restrain or to abstain from something and according to the Sharia it means abstaining from obviously food drink or sexual intercourse and other acts that are mentioned within the divine laws during and in the prescribed ways so it's also followed by the abstinence from and this is seldom known foolish talking talking for no reason okay obscenity and other forms of prohibited uh, and disliked speech so you know we know this obviously due to the narrations of hadith and from within the Quran uh, and we'll take a look at a lot of this um, in general the beginning of its obligation happened in the second year of Hijra and when we begin talking about fiqh issues usually you know there's a lot of like prerequisites that we try to you know come to understand and the first of which is and I'm really just gonna touch on this one just so people here understand is that when we look at fiqh we try and look at the principle that says reduce the or removal of difficulty from the society and from the worshiper within that society so this is the goal here and we can see this obviously within the Quran and the Sunnah being displayed often and the first issue that comes up is none other than the moon sighting battle <clears throat> and the moon sighting battle is something that happens every year without you know without a doubt now why is there so much confusion around this issue each and every single year the Prophet ﷺ narrated through a variety of various sources when you see the new moon observe the fast and when you see it again then break it and if the sky is cloudy for you then calculate it so what this means is that we begin the fast by one of two methods okay the first one is 
We see the moon on the night of the 29th, and then, inshallah, the next day becomes uh, Ramadan. Number two, if we don't see the moon for any reason, i.e. it's cloudy, for instance, then we complete 30 days, and the next day after that will be considered the first of the month. Okay? There have been differences of opinion amongst the scholars regarding the amount of witnesses needed to establish, and that's you know, neither here nor there for a topic of this nature. We're not going to get into that. It's a bit more advanced fiqh. But the reason really why this issue is complicated, it comes down to two modern issues. The first of these issues is what we do if someone sights the moon from a locality that is not your locality. Are you obliged to observe the fast on account of a sighting that occurred outside of where you live, where your society is. And in today's sort of iPhone, iPad, i whatever, right? At the drop of a dime, you can literally get facts from halfway around the world. You know, you're connecting with people from different cities, different states, countries, etc. So for instance, and this is a prime example that usually happens, your friend or family member calls you from Kuala Lumpur, and you know, you're in New York City, for instance, and they tell you that they saw the moon. Are you obliged to follow that society's sighting, or is every community restricted to their own visual sightings? Now, obviously, no one during the 7th and 8th centuries had cell phones, right? And when we look at this issue, we want to go back to the classical understanding, what the Sahaba did, what the Prophet ﷺ taught, and those that followed them and those that followed them. <clears throat> we do know that they would send messengers, what are known as uh, barids, to neighboring lands to deliver messages. Okay? And they did this as fast as humanly possible for their time. And horses at that time, what would end up happening was they would take their men from city to city and then they would exchange the horse in each city, right? As to not to wear down uh, the horses, not to tire the animals. And it actually allowed for a reasonably fast method of delivering things. And although it seems that this issue is an advent of the modern era, it's actually something that the earliest generations of Muslims dealt with. The scholars of the Tabi'un and the Atba' Tabi'un differed amongst themselves on whether the sighting of another city sufficed or not. Okay? Some of the scholars of the time said that the Ummah should follow one sighting to the greatest extent possible. Other scholars disagreed. They said you know, every matla or uh, every segment of the earth in direct correlation to their latitude should have their own sightings. But in conclusion, what we can see and what's quite evident to see is that the issue of the moon sighting is really a theoretical debate. Okay? It's a theoretical debate, really, based on the fact that since the earliest of times, the Ummah has never really been united over one Eid. Okay, the Muslims of the early generations who lived in China, for instance, could never have known the sightings of the Muslims who lived in Spain. Yeah? So, you know, obviously the distance between these lands and the mass amount of Muslim communities within those two areas, you know, we see that this has now become a, a theoretical debate. So, one of the reasons it never caused problems back then as it does today, was because every governorship or the principal leaders within each of the communities and the regions would announce the start and end times of the community and the community just simply followed. Whatever the Khalifa said, that's what it was. You know? And it wasn't until the modern era or the delineation of the Ummah uh, into these the modern nation states that we see today, that this became an issue in general. Which means that those who are calling for a unified sighting 
Okay? We've probably all seen this or heard this from people. Are looking for something really that never existed. Okay? In the history of the Ummah, this has never existed. And if we were to follow in the footsteps of the righteous predecessors of our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then we should follow our local community's rulings. So these are our communities, these are the families that we're going to be eating with, inshallah. You know, we'll be praying with them in our masajid, tarawih, etc. And, you know, God willing, celebrating the Eid or the feast at the end of this. So, the clear proof of this can be seen in the hadith of Quraib, who narrated that Umm al Fadl sent him from Medina to Muawiyah ibn, Sufi- ibn Abi Sufyan in the Shem, or what is now the greater uh, Syria area. Right? And he said, I came to Hashem and completed her, Umm al Fadl's errand. Then the new crescent of Ramadan was sighted while I was in Hashem. I saw the new crescent of the night, on the night of Friday, sorry. Then I came to Al Medina at the end of the month. Abdullah ibn Abbas asked me about the sighting of the moon and said, When did you see it? I said, We saw it on the night of Friday. He said, You saw it on the night of Friday? I said, Yes. And the people saw it and started fasting. And so did Muawiyah. He said, But we saw it on the night of Saturday. So we will continue fasting until we have completed 30 days or we see it. I said, Will you not be content with the sighting of Muawiyah and his companions? He said, No. This is what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam enjoined upon us. So as we can see from the earliest of generations, Abdullah ibn Abbas right, stated that this was in keeping with the tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the question then comes up, what are we legally bound to? Okay? The account of the hadith of Quraib, we see that neither Ibn Abbas nor Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan debated their differences, you know, with the advancements of technology that we're able to obviously now instantaneously know what people around the globe are doing. Uh, it raises some speculation. So the question lingers, you know, are we able to know, since we are able to know what Ibn Abbas and Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan were not able to because of their time, does this change the ruling? And furthermore, one can ask, with the advent of the Muslim minority communities around the world with no unified legal entity, nor a unified global entity, who are we then liable to? And the case is that no entity within the communities around the world can force you to conform to their rulings, you know, especially within secular states you know, here in America. The ruling then becomes up to the individual to do what he or she thinks best. You know. King Fahd Mosque, for instance, can't force you to fast on you know, Friday if it happens to come on a Friday. So it's up to you. Yet, in my humble opinion, to follow the rulings of the sightings that are coming from Saudi Arabia, Al Azhar, or whatever other entity that exists around the Muslim, quote unquote, Muslim world, um, it's, you know, quite frankly, it's just, it's kind of ignorant, really. Because whether you reside in the USA, if you reside in the UK, or whatnot, any other Muslim minority countries, one truly needs to think of ways to unite the community by creating a structure to allow these societies that we live in to be able to deal with these issues. You know, very much so a lot of times when we have an issue within our community, 
the first thing that we do is we go look at Saudi Arabia. And, you know, not only is this, you know, a show of ignorance, because we're dealing with two completely different societies here, but, you know, we are also limiting our scholars, the people that, you know, are in our communities, to take the necessary actions ourselves, you know, which is limiting the community. That's why we have such a problem in America with community. Is because we have yet to get together and try to situate these problems like they do in Saudi Arabia, like they do in Cairo, in Syria or whatnot. You know, so you, you have these issues. This is why I take the position that I take. You know, but once again, what are you legally bound to? You're legally bound to, you know, your own personal opinion when it comes to this. Um, how do I start? Okay. And this is actually quite easy. And in general, just so you know, the fiqh of Ramadan in, you know, in looking at the other principles of fiqh throughout, you know, the Islamic bodies of sciences or whatnot, it's, it's actually very clear. It's quite easy in comparison to the rest. You know, there's... Very little that the scholars differentiated about amongst themselves. But how do I start? All that one needs to do is to have the niyyah, the intention, and to abstain from that which terminates the fast. Those are the two things. And I'm going to say this to you right now because there's a lot of what is about to be said that really is just going to go back to you making the best judgment. And, you know, the vast amount of work that has been done in Islam usually attributes the hadith of the niyyah that we have from Umar ibn al-Khattab that related from the Prophet ﷺ who said, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَّةِ That verily action is done by intention. So I ask you to keep this in mind when looking at Ramadan when looking at all of these rulings in general and just ask yourself, what is my intention behind this? And really, you know, you have a lot to say when it comes to this act specifically. Now, some scholars say that you need to make the niyyah each and every single day before you begin the fast. You know, it's kind of a, a tough, tough decision. So, Really, if someone oversleeps and then wakes up late, you know, they forget to eat suhoor, you know, and they're wondering, is my fast valid now? You know, this is a bit over. You know, there's a ruling that says if you make the intention at the beginning of the month for the entirety of the month, then this is sufficient. You know, and this was, for instance, this was Imam Malik's position. To make the niya at the beginning of the month that you are you know, going to fast the month of Ramadan. And for women, you know, this is the exact same thing. When they go through their menses during the month, then after coming out of it, they then make their niyyah again for the remainder of that month. For nafil fasting, there's a difference. So it's a completely different ruling for nafil fasting. For nafil fasting, you don't have to make intention before the fasting. Okay, so for example, you wake up at 10 o'clock, you haven't eaten anything since Feg, you say, you know what, I want to fast for the rest of the day. Completely permissible. Right? So in contrast to the fard fast, which you have to have the niyyah. And number two, is what we said was abstain from that which breaks the fast. So what breaks the fast? Number one, and there are, are six things that break the fast. Number one is eating and drinking intentionally. So if you are fasting and you intentionally, knowing that you are fasting, eat or drink, then your fast is no longer valid. Right? Unintentional eating is seen as a gift from Allah and the person should thank Allah when he or she remembers and then carry on fasting. 
Right? The Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, whoever eats and drinks forgetfully, then he has not broken the fast. For it was only a provision that Allah provided for him. And this is in Bukhari. So you pass by a water fountain, you're at school, you're at work or whatnot, you know, going about your day, you take a sip of water, you remember, no problem. Right? This is a gift from Allah. Yeah. Suppose though that you witness your brother or sister who you know, is drinking, do you say, well, I'm not going to tell them because this is a gift from Allah? <laughs> no. Although they would love it, probably, you should say it, you know. Number two is intercourse. So we're talking about the actual act of intercourse itself and not certain acts of intimacy, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. You know, romance or foreplay or things like that. There's a certain level of it that's permissible. Okay. Number three is vomiting intentionally. And intentionally here means that the individual caused themselves to vomit. So there's a narration from the Prophet wasallam in a hadith collected by Abu Dawood that says, if one has a sudden attack of vomiting while one is fasting, then no atonement is required of him. But if he vomits intentionally, then he must make an atonement. Fast at that point is no longer valid. So therefore, you know, you, you put your finger in your mouth or by any other means, which causes you to vomit based on this hadith, you know, the consensus is that intentional vomiting means that your fast is no longer valid. Number four is ejaculation. In, you know, intentional ejaculation is in a state of wakefulness through whether you're pleasuring yourself, otherwise, right? And this is in contrast to one who is in a state of sleep and ejaculates, for instance. Okay, this does not invalidate the fast. As the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, when one sleeps, the pen has been lifted. Number five is accidentally breaking the fast at the wrong time. And this is a very, well, not very, but it's, it's a controversial issue. Um, so there's a difference of opinion when it comes to this issue. The fiqh behind this issue is a bit complex, but, you know, let's just take a look real quick at kind of what's involved here. Firstly, there's a term within fiqh that, you know, in its translation would mean the presumption of continuity. The principle of the presumption of continuity. And what I mean by that is you're allowed to presume certain acts and their rulings within a given time period. And those acts are permissible based upon the continuity of it. Yet to break the presumption of continuity requires that you have some type of solid evidence, some knowledge, some type of confidence. Yaqeen has to be involved here. And for example, you wake up in the middle of the night, the presumption is that you are allowed to eat because it's night. Therefore, if you eat and then realize that Fajr was called way earlier, no problem. You know, you thought wrong. But you're forgiven for your mistake and you should resume fasting. Whereas when you break your fast, or when you break the fast before you, you know, you're allowed to break the fast, and obviously this is with good intention, of course, we're not talking about somebody who intentionally is trying to, you know, override the fast here or something. No. But one who has good intention breaks the fast, you're forgiven, but you have to make up the fast. And this is because of that principle. The presumption of continuity at this point is that you were fasting, so you should have a higher level of yaqeen, or solid conviction or evidence before you break the presumption of continuity. Does everybody get that? Okay. When do we fast? During the daytime, right? So if you're going to go against the fast during the daytime, you need to have solid evidence for it. 
which means that you need to make sure that it's time to break your fast. On the opposite end, if you wake up in the middle of the night, the presumption was you're not fasting, right? Because we don't fast during the middle of the night. So if you ate something, when you woke up at night, you realized, hey, you know, I've, uh, I've, I've eaten something and the time is way past fed. It's okay. Why? Because the presumption that you were under was that it was still night. It was okay for you to do it. And so based on this ruling, it's okay. On the opposite end, you need to have yaqeen. You're forgiven for it, but you need to make up the fast. And this is because you need to be sure, right? You need to be sure. So take care of this issue. Be sure of the time when you break your fast. And in contrast, anything that goes against the presumption of what, you know, is allowable during that time period. So, <clears throat> number six is injections that are nourishing. So, i.e. in our times, you know, drips, things like that. Obviously, there isn't classical text on this issue. Okay? This is a modern issue. So, the majority fit councils around the world say, all types of injections are permissible except those that are nourishing or sustaining. So, you know, as we said before, things like drips or whatnot, but if you're taking local anesthesia, um, you know, things of this nature, it's totally permissible. What are the penalties? So breaking any of the terms of the fast requires that the person seeks forgiveness first and foremost and then makes up what he or she might have missed. Now the only thing that requires you to physically make up the fast and also puts on you a kafara or uh, a fine is intentionally engaging in intercourse during the fast without a valid excuse. Right? Footnote here, what's a valid excuse? Valid excuse if you both are traveling, for instance, you know, during Ramadan, you're not obliged to fast. You know. There's an ikhtilaf when it comes to this issue, but for the most part, this is what the ruling is. So, in this case, there's a severe penalty. And number one, Free a slave. It's kind of impossible to do these days. So we go straight to number two. Fast for 60 consecutive days. Right? Fasting for 60 consecutive days. And if for some medical reason you can't fast for 60 consecutive days, then you go to number three, which is feed 60 poor people. Okay, so it's a pretty severe penalty. Sorry? Yeah. yeah. Well, the kafara for the kafara in general is to feed sixty people. So after that, let's look at some of the common misconceptions, and this is um, get some time. The general ruling. Um, is used to define the letter of the law of fasting. And the letter of the law of fasting is that which enters the throat. Okay? Just everybody keep that in mind. Put it in the back of your mind. That which enters the throat is the letter of the law when it comes to fasting. So, and this is in contrast to what a lot of people think today, which is whatever goes in my mouth itself. If something goes in my mouth, I broke my fast. This is wrong. It's whatever enters the throat breaks your fast. So the first common misconception is inhalers. So if you have asthma or any issue that entails the need of an inhaler, the inhaler has been a pretty common misconception in general. And it's something that scholars have said, you know, break the fast. But really, when we look at it in light of 
you know, the science that's involved, we realize that the inhaler is a medical device, obviously used to deliver medication into the lungs to treat, you know, medical conditions. And although it's taken through the mouth and the throat, it's not a source of nourishment, you know. It's not an actual solid or a liquid, right. Yes, obviously the molecules are going in and whatnot, but again, when we go to this type of, you know, fact or trying to reason these types of things, we've gone too far. You know, these things don't need to go that far. You know, Allah is not trying to make things that difficult for us. So, and this is, you know, the evidence that's been given by the OIC Fit Council as being permissible. They have stated that this is permissible. By the way, the OIC Fit Council or the Organization of Islamic Conference, it's the largest body of scholars today. be a no fast at all. And I'm actually going to get to, to that at the end, but it wouldn't be a fast at all. Um, so anyways, uh, the OIC, Organization of Islamic Conference, largest body of scholars that we have today, you know, it's a UN body, you know, under, you know, all of the Muslim countries sort of are under it. And there's an annual conference that takes place in Mecca every year, obviously. And they discuss fic issues and they, you know, it's the largest fic council in the world. And most of the rulings within this area are coming from them. Number two, small amounts of medicines that have been put into eyes, ears, nose, things like that. The majority opinion, you know, in our time, and it obviously we're not, we're talking about, you know, things that don't go into excess, you know excessively doing these things, you know, you run the risk of breaking your fast. But if it's, you know, the normal dosage, you know, then you're fine, inshallah. Number three, as we talked about, was injections. Number four, any type of dental work that is done where it doesn't reach the throat. Okay? So when we make wudu, we do, you know, mad mada, instant shock, and things like that. So, it's okay, and we've been told to do this excessively by the Prophet during normal uh, periods of time outside of Ramadan. In Ramadan, you know, we should be a bit more conservative about it. Don't go overboard, don't do this in excess because, you know, putting that much water in your mouth, gargling and whatnot, you run the risk of uh, swallowing something. But again, we go back to the principle here, you know, so when you forget it, the dentist, it's that which, you know, enters the throat. So usually, you know, you're completely fine doing, you know, a lot of dental work nowadays. Just make sure that you keep the ruling in the back of your head. Uh, number five, brushing your teeth. And this goes back again to the same principle. You know, if it doesn't reach the throat, it's permissible. And even using toothpaste, it's okay. You know, I've had some brothers come up to me and say, you know, it's a, can I use toothpaste? Yeah, you can use toothpaste, no problem. You know, and just make sure that you rinse your mouth out, spitting everything out, and inshallah, it's completely fine. You know, obviously, take precaution, maybe in the clear. Number six, chewing food. Okay, before there was Gerber, things like that, mothers had to chew food for their kids, feed them. So the scholars allow it based on the fact that it is an action, again, of the tongue, and it should not go past the throat. Okay? And number seven is romance, or, and or foreplay. And this is not actual intimacy. Aisha, radiallahu anha, reported that Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa kissed his wives during Ramadan while observing the fast. But she added, afterwards she said, but who amongst you could control his desires like he could? You know, 
This intimacy, from this we see that this intimacy is permissible, but you should be cautious of it. You know, if you fear that it's going to take you too far, keep away from it. The penalty is a pretty grave penalty, right? Number eight, and this is something that is kind of new. I haven't really heard this uh, except for the last maybe four or five years or so. I'm not really sure why. But being in a state of janaba at the time of fagr. No problem. There's no problem with that. Okay? You are not required to be tahir in a state of ritual purity before you fast. Okay, so for example, if you're in a state of janaba at the time that you fall asleep, you wake up before fajr, you don't have to make ghusl before fajr. Okay? Similarly, women who have finished their menses before fajr, even if it's only five minutes prior to fajr, are required to fast even, again, if they haven't made ghusl prior to the fajr. Right? Prior to the Fajr then they haven't made ghusr, it doesn't matter. You know, this is an issue, by the way, that women a lot of times get very lazy with. And it's an important issue to note because, you know, there's really no excuse when it comes to laziness. So, you know, I'm talking to a lot of guys right now, I'm not really sure if the women are hearing this, but relay the message to mothers, sisters, wives, whatnot, inshallah. <clears throat> um, number nine is tasting food out of necessity. So if your work requires the tasting of food, for instance, you know, since it's an action of the tongue, again, it doesn't hit the throat, it's permissible to taste it. Right? The scholars have mentioned that this should not be overused or misused. So whether you're a chef or a professional cook or whatnot, you know, you just need to make sure that you spit out, you know, what has been in your mouth. You wash your mouth out with water, spit it out, you're in the clear. You know. Number 10, obviously we talked about this unintentional vomiting. You know, we said intentional vomiting breaks the fast. Unintentional vomiting is excused, inshallah. And number 11 is the last one, and I kind of kept it to the last one because it's the most controversial. Uh, and that is withdrawing blood. Now it's controversial because in general we're talking here about sort of again a, a very advanced fiqh, not for today but you know maybe later on we do a class or something about some of the advanced topics in fiqh. And we should know that the majority of madhabs don't consider withdrawing blood to break your fast. The Hanbali madhab say or says that if you give a copious a lot of blood then it breaks your fast right. but the majority of scholars don't agree with this and they say that it doesn't break the fast but when you look at it really it's a noteworthy gray area you know their scholars bring forth their hadiths you know the other scholars bring forth their hadiths they go back and forth with this and, and really you know again in my humble opinion it's something that does not break the fast, but we should, you know, refrain from it. The etiquettes of fasting. Now, number one, the first thing is eating suhoor. Now, suhoor linguistically, we're talking about a word that comes from, it comes from the same word as sahara, same root word, or sihr, magic. And it's the deception of the eye, to do something when no one can see you. Right? Linguistically here, we're talking about you know, the terminology of this meaning. It's the food that you eat before the time of fajr. And the Prophet ﷺ said, تَصَحَّرُوا فَإِنَّ فِي السَّحُورِ بَرَقًا The Prophet ﷺ takes suhoor as there is a blessing in it. And the Prophet ﷺ said, My ummah will remain in good as long as they delay suhoor and hasten to iftar. Break your iftar right away. Also, Aisha anha, narrated, the Prophet ﷺ said, Bilal announces the adhan at night. So eat and drink, i.e. suhoor, till Umm Maktoum pronounces the adhan. 
And the Sahabi who related this hadith said that the difference between the two was about five minutes. So this explains why and how, you know, suhoor explains why and how we're able to fast for so long under such conditions. And especially, you know, the fast that we're about to embark on, inshallah, is one of the summertime. Very long, hot. My advice is make sure you're eating suhoor every single day. Don't skip it. You know, it's, I mean, keep it real. It's just, it's hard. And there is barakah in suhoor. The Prophet ﷺ has mentioned it over and over and over again. And barakah, what do we mean by barakah? We mean that it allows you more than its normal intake. So you get more out of it than you normally would. You know, that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, eat suhoor even if only a gulp of water. So, also Aisha anha narrated that people will always be fine, this is going back again, on the right path or following the sunnah as long as they hasten to break their fast in Ramadan. Now, I'm not going to go into, there's an issue that always comes up in fiqh when it comes to, you know, the, the Isna versus the Umm al Qura issue, and maybe we'll just talk about it later. You know, is Feg 15 degrees or is it 20 degrees? You know, when are we supposed to be, you know, breaking and fasting and when does it start and whatnot? Honestly, the timing is not set in stone, okay? So, suppose the chart says, for instance, 451. You wake up at 451. It's okay, you know, rush to your kitchen, make something small, and there's no problem in it. Okay? The sharia is not down to a millisecond. We don't, we're not looking at the, the minute the second hits, it's done, you know? And honestly, if you're in the middle of the desert, for instance, you know, you're not going to do this. And I remember being in... Egypt, you know, taking trips to Sahara. We didn't have clocks and making sure that things were... You look, you know, it's rough. We're talking a minute here, two minutes there, right? Now, obviously, don't take this to an extreme. This is not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that, you know, you wake up 10 minutes late, no problem, go and eat. No, this is a bit over, right? But the recommendation here from the scholars themselves is that you know, it's okay. And to not be like other religions who've changed their religion to just rituals, right? Have some rahmah, mercy. It's okay. Allah has allowed this. So we're okay. Obviously, again, don't take advantage of it. But it happens to all of us. Wallahi, it happens to me. You know, and if this happens once in a while, it's okay, inshallah. Number two is... Make sure to break the iftar right away. Hasten to the iftar. Breaking the fast as early as possible. You know, basically what this means is don't delay iftar beyond maghrib. And there are some groups out there that think that they should delay iftar until after the maghrib. You know, this is wrong. We break immediately at the adhan of maghrib. Number three, the Prophet's practice was to break the fast with moist dates. In Arabic, it's called rutab. And there's a hadith that relates this, but scholars have mentioned that it isn't a hadith, you know, necessarily, meaning he didn't tell us this, but he would do this. Either way, whether he said it or he did it, you know, it's sunnah. That's what we should know. If no dates, then water. And of course, too, he would have an odd number of dates. So break three, five, and this is from the sunnah. And we're, I'm not really sure even if we have moist dates because I know that there are some that brothers that bring it from uh, Saudi or Egypt or whatnot, but you know, it's a lot better to do it and you know, the, 
The sunnah is moist dates. Okay? Just keep that in mind. Number four, and this is one that hopefully, you know, if you don't take anything other than this, take this. Making dua before breaking the fast. There's a hadith from an Nisa'i where the Prophet ﷺ said, of the du'as that are never rejected is the du'a of the sa'im idha aftar. So obviously, you know, the, the sa'im, the one who's fasting before going into his fast. Obviously this is because, you know, before maghrib by 5 to 10 minutes, <laughs> the only thing we're thinking about is yeah, yeah, how many kuftas we're going to throw down on. How many samosas we're going to chow down. And, you know, obviously, when we look at this, if a person can concentrate on making dua at this time, then you've really shown what your priorities are. You know what I mean? So, and a lot of us neglect this. It's very sad, really. But inshallah, you know, let's make a pact right now from me to you guys, everybody here, inshallah, that when we're at each other's homes, you know, before Maghrib, by five to ten minutes, let one of us tell the rest of the group who's probably talking about sports or politics or whatever, right? Nonsense. Hey guys, you know, five minutes before Maghrib, let's take these five minutes, make dhikr, make dua. You know, and inshallah ta'ala, it'll benefit us and the ummah. Number five is inviting people to eat from your plate of food, i.e. to invite people to eat. You know, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever provides iftar for the fasting person, person should also get a share of that reward without diminishing the one who's fasting's reward. You know, it's definitely a part of our Sunnah, it's definitely been a part of our tradition. Alhamdulillah, whether it's at a house or at the masjid, we see it all around the world. You go to you know, places like Egypt or Saudi or whatnot, this is a prominent part. We thank Allah for allowing it to be a prominent part of what we do in our tradition. You know, and we want to keep it up and keep going with it. And by the way, you know, the masjid is still looking for, I don't know how many days, I think, in the morning, we were around 14 or 15 days to sponsor. You know, as we know, the masjid sponsors iftar every single night. You know, if we all pulled together something, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, wallahi, we could, you know, sponsor even just half. And it's, it's a huge thing. Number six, fasting with the soul along with the body. You know, this is a lecture in and of itself, but... You know, we're going to restrict it to just that. And what we mean by, obviously, fasting with the soul along with the body, we can go back to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he said, fasting is protection. as jannah Therefore, when one of you is fasting, let him not engage in vain or useless talk. And if someone tries to engage in an argument with him, let him respond by saying, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. Wallahi, this is one of the biggest ones that we need to remember. And alhamdulillah, we don't see it too much here in America. But, you know, overseas a lot of times I've seen, you know, you wouldn't think that this is Ramadan. You're stuck in the middle of traffic and we don't think it's going to happen now, but just wait, you know. Six o'clock rolls around, you realize, man, I still got two and a half more hours. It's hot. You're on the 405. Some guy cuts you off, screams at you. Remember this hadith. Yeah. I'm fasting. <laughs> I'm fasting. It's a beautiful hadith, really. Because if you think about it, usually we try and hide our good deeds, right? It's kind of a principle within Islam. We hide our good deeds. You don't publicize it. But in this case, to, you know, to stoop to his level nullifies the fast, basically. Not from a fiqh perspective, but 
from a spiritual perspective. So it's better for you to announce your private ibadah at that point in order to preserve the purity of the fast. You know, the Prophet ﷺ also said in a famous hadith, whoever does not abstain from evil talk and actions, Allah has no need uh, that that person abstains from food and drink. And there's also a hadith collected by Imam Ahmad where the Prophet ﷺ said, it's possible that a person only gains from his fasting hunger and thirst. The purpose of fasting is for spiritual purity. And inshallah we will you know, further our studies when it comes to that, make that a goal to really try and figure out what our goals are when it comes to uh, Ramadan. And you know, inshallah ta'ala that will be a blessing for us throughout the ages. Uh, obviously, I think we got maybe 10 minutes. I just want to go in real quick because uh, there's one thing that I haven't gotten to yet, but I still want time for people to ask their questions. But those who don't fast with a valid excuse, there's four categories. And I'm going to try to run through this super quick, so if there's questions afterwards or whatnot, I'll hang around. But there are four categories. And the first category is the category that it's haram to fast. They must break the fast. And this category, obviously, we're talking about here, women in their monthly cycle and their postpartum bleeding, right? nifas. <clears throat> and this category, you are not allowed to fast. And this is by unanimous opinion. There's no ikhtilaf whatsoever when it comes to this. Number two is the travelers and those who have what, what they call minor sicknesses. So things like severe headaches or a fever or any type of sickness that is a hardship to fast. What is this? Use your common sense. You know, again, you know when you're sick, when you're not sick. You know, you know, just really try and think of on the day of judgment, you know, if Allah asks you about this illness, if you're really ill, then you have a legitimate claim. If not, and you're trying to pass one, I mean, you need to think about what you're trying to do here. But, you know, Imam Ahmed was asked, for instance, is a fever considered sickness? And his reply was, if a fever isn't sickness, then what is sickness? Right? So a fever is considered sickness. And Allahu alam. The Sharia does not require you to go to a doctor, by the way, to get an exemption, you know, you're going to get a doctor's note to give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment or something like this. It's kind of no need for that. You make your own judgment. It's okay. Right? And Sheikh Yasir Qadi in Memphis says, you know, ask yourself, are you to the level of sickness that if you would fast, your fast would make you more sick? I think this is a good, you know, way to gauge it. Um, there's another issue that we talk about in this, which is the traveler, you know, and that comes into then well, what is a traveler? And we don't really have too much time to go into it, but, you know, the traveler is, you know, someone who has psychologically traveling. Um, number three, we're talking elderly people who can't fast and those who are permanently sick. So the difference between the second category and the first, or the second category and the third is that one is temporary, one is, you know, these people are sick, uh, permanent sickness. Okay, then. Okay, then. okay, we're going to stop for the then real quick and then continue. Allah Akbar Allah Akbar Allah Akbar Allah Akbar 
أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد الرسول الله أشهد أن محمد الرسول الله Salatu wa salam ala rasulullah. Okay, I'm gonna, only going to take five, five minutes. Um, to close out, really, we were talking about elderly people who uh, can't fast and those who are permanently sick. So, obviously here the difference is we're talking about someone who's permanently sick to one who is a temporary sickness. And the sharia allows them to make up every day by giving food to the poor, right? وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُتَّقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ تَعَمُ مِسْكِينَ Ibn Abbas said, this ayah applies to the elderly and those who are permanently sick. So they have a fidya and the fidya is تَعَمُ miskin, to feed the miskin. And the calculation should be weighted to the society. So for instance, you know, MJ, the assembly of Muslim jurists in America have said eight dollars roughly, you know, and it's we're talking about a meal here. So one meal roughly within the community that you live in, don't look at the communities outside of where you live in to judge, you know. And if we look at it for instance, if the number is eight, you know, there's thirty days, eight times thirty is two hundred and forty dollars, you can feed thirty people or you can feed the same person for 30 days. You know, logistics was really left up to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the last thing is the one that's most controversial and that's the one that we left to last because we have no time. But it really doesn't involve us. It's the women who are breastfeeding or pregnant. It's something that comes up often since it's just a bunch of guys right now. And I'm not really sure that there are women here. We'll leave it to that. If somebody does want to know, they can come up to me later. Um, and that's really all I have for you. If there are any questions, uh, I think we could take for maybe just a couple minutes really quick. If not, I'll make a du'a and we'll close out. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiraka wa natubu ilayk. Allahumma balighna ramadan. 
اللهم بلغنا رمضان اللهم بلغنا رمضان تقبل منا يا أرحم الراحمين وآخر دعواتنا إن الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين